What is the recommended daily dose of curcumin? I would say uh, of a, a good potency curcumin. A good potency curcumin would be 500 milligrams twice a day. Uh, so what genetic markers do you believe can predispose someone to develop autism? Well, I think that MTHFR, which is written here, is, it has to do with the folate, the folate cycle and the need for methylated uh, folate, methylated B12. I do think that is very helpful. Um, and I, I, I don't want to get too into it because there's so many complexities in autism. I would show slides about where, where all these different genetic polymorphisms are. But there are a number of them. And the thing with the autistic kids is not just one. We look at MTHFR and all of them. But nowadays you can get 23 and me pretty inexpensively and you can get an interpretation to help you try to navigate. One thing I would say is remember, genetics are just landmarks. So people who get treated just with their genetics, they miss the whole thing. You need somebody to take the genetics and incorporate it into your clinical situation with your labs. But I've seen people just be treated for, for genetics and I don't really approve of that because it's just a roadmap. Uh, how would you differentiate uh, between PANS, PANDAS, and, M and MSIDS that uh, Dr. Horowitz will talk about in kids and young adults with neuropsych disorders, especially Bartonella? Well, I think I might have answered that, that you just have to think about it because Bartonella may be part of PANS. So a lot of it is just nomenclature. So Bartonella could be a chronic infection that you need to treat with antibiotics. But they're, they're, just like in Lyme, there may be a whole other element of autoimmunity plus the infection. So you want to do both anti-infective treatment as well as uh, immune modulation. Okay. Um, what is your exposure using essential ph phospholipids such as phospholcholine uh, or GPC and iridine butyrate treating autism pans and MSIDs? Um, I have a lot of experience with using phosphatidylcholine. We give it to uh, we give it to kids uh, in the autism spectrum. Some kids use it, it's phosphatidylcholine is a, a lipid. It's a fatty. It's a fat that's an essential part of your membranes around your cells. And a lot of people have unhealthy membranes. So part of taking fish oils, just so you know, fish oils. A, a, a friend and colleague years ago, unfortunately passed away years ago. Neil Lawrence, he used to refer to fish oils like, like an oil change. You gotta give it one to three months to change the oils in your cell membranes. And so phosphatidylcholine is another phospholipid, very important in your cell membranes. So we give it sometimes to kids with autism, we give it to kids with ADHD, we give it to people with mold problems, mycotoxins, and chemical exposures, because it's very good for the cell membranes. Um, Do you think it's okay to treat children under eight years old with doxycycline? What do you use for these youngsters with a tick bite? No, I won't, because it can cause problems in the teeth, and um, it's, only, it's only been said it's okay for over eight, so I won't do it, no. So I use Ceftin, which works. Uh, Zithromax is okay, amoxicillin, Biaxin. The number of drugs you can use, but you can't use doxycycline and minocycline under it. I wouldn't do it. What is the optimal level of vitamin D in a blood test? Okay, the range on the lab slip is 30 to 50. No, I think everybody should be 50 to 60, maybe even 70. Higher levels of vitamin D can help prevent against autoimmunity, okay? Um, can you almost heal Lyme with diet and medicine together? I would say that uh, I would say that um, diet is one of the things. Lyme is inflammatory. Lyme causes all these issues, and we like to try to de to decrease inflammation in all these chronic illnesses. And gluten and or dairy or another food that you may be sensitive or allergic to can be inflammatory. So yes, diet is part of the program. It's not the only thing. In, in my uh, practice and the way I look at things, I'm pretty sure Dr. Horowitz agrees with this as well, is you need antibiotics to kill the Lyme or the co-infection, but you also need the diet and the nutrients to support the healing. Uh, is there a connection between Lyme's and Crohn's disease? I'm not aware of a specific connection, although I do think that, uh, that underlying Crohn's disease can be infections 
and Lyme can contribute to inflammation. Certainly, as I told you, can Bartonella. So I think you have to think of these things when you see them, but I wouldn't say I would think about Lyme as a What basic advice would you give to someone who finds an attack, attached tick on their, and their doctor says to wait for symptoms? Well, waiting for symptoms is one way. Waiting for uh, flu-like symptoms, looking for the rash, that is one way to do it. But I always would say if you choose that direction, that you get a blood test, including a Lyme titer and Western blot, not just the titer, in six weeks. And preferably with a good lab like Igenix. If you do that, that's one way. Um, so, the other way is if you're going to do that, there are certain herbs and Lyme transfer factors that I would give to help the immune system if indeed something was going on while you're waiting um, that we do sometimes if someone says, I don't want to treat. We can give herbs, we can give immune modulators during that time. If we're going to give an antibiotic, we give it for three weeks. We do not give two pills, we do not give seven days, 10 days, two weeks. We believe in giving it for three weeks. And if you have that EM rash, we like to treat probably, at least would be four weeks, but I would suggest at least six weeks, if not more. You need to treat it long enough to get at it, okay? That's important. Oh, sorry. They can't hear you in the back. Okay, anyway, that was, you need to treat it long enough. Three weeks for a tick bite, preferably like six weeks for uh, the, the rash, if not even more, but certainly at the very least four, at the very least four weeks. Um, well, stevia. stevia, we do use stevia sometimes. It can sometimes help with the biofilms as well. I think Dr. Harwish is going to talk more about that, but we use, you know, uh, I have, I'm very lucky. I just recently, my, my longtime associate retired. Uh, he had some health problems, and uh, I just have a new nurse practitioner named Summer Del Signori. She's actually a specialist in Lyme and co infections and the whole PANS PANDAS. And, uh, she uses a lot of the uh, a lot of the herbs and, and stevia as well. She uses higher doses. I usually use like 30 drops. That's uh, it's like one mil. She'll even use two mils twice a day. Then you can use either 20 to 30 drops. This is of a specific type. But uh, so stevia may have a place. I mean, it's, it's not the treatment of Lyme disease, but it, again, especially if you're looking at biofilms, you have to use enzymes to break up the biofilms and do whatever you can. Oh, this is very sweet. I'm not sure she. Thank you, Dr. Rocky. You saved my life. That's very sweet. Thank you, Lori. That's, the truth is, the work we do is very difficult. It's very complex. You have to be able to multitask. You have a lot of very sick people. But the reality is, when you bring people back to life, uh, there's not the right. And when, especially with the kids, I take care of kids and adults. But when you bring a kid who's really severe, bedridden or whatever, when you, find you bring them back to life, you don't only heal the child, you heal the parents, the siblings, the aunts and uncles, the grandparents. And it is, I, I tell you, it's nothing more gratifying. Nothing more gratifying. Um, something about essential oils. I don't use a lot of essential oils. I just use lavender for the hyperactivity in the kids. And somebody's talking about internal use. I only know them as external, so I wouldn't use them internally. Um, and I can talk about that. If someone has Lyme, does it affect pneumonia? Not sure what that's really asking, unless they have mycoplasma pneumonia with them, but I don't know about Lyme affecting pneumonia. There's a bunch of questions. That, uh, this looks like something. My husband was bitten 20 years ago, was on doxycycline, and we forgot about it. Forget about it. He has heart disease, family history, but has also began to show signs of dementia. Is dementia a possibility of Lyme? Well, that's actually very, I didn't even see that, but it's a very interesting question. I have a number of patients, more even recently coming, with dementia. Um, some, some with pretty significantly progressive dementia. And with histories of Lyme disease. Oh, I'm sorry. So, adults, uh, you know, either 50s or 60s, I think more like, with progressive dementia, who have a history of Lyme disease. And the question is, when you, one of them, we did a PET scan, and it said Alzheimer's disease. 
I know she had Lyme for years and years. I wanted to treat her. Insurance wouldn't cover it. We did treat her years ago, but not. They wouldn't do it long enough. Um, she got. She didn't come back for follow up and came in off and on. So I think she does have Lyme disease. Now, is the Lyme disease causing the dementia? You, it can cause dementia, just like syphilis causes dementia. And uh, in this other patient, Lyme disease inadequately treated. Could it be doing it? Yes. But it gets tricky. I think they need to be treated for both. So you know, you can give a medicine for Alzheimer's. Some of the things like Aricept, I don't really like. I don't think it does that great. But some like Amenda sometimes help, and phosphatidylcholine, and there are certain things for the brain we can use. Um, but treating Lyme, but at that level, I think they need IV antibiotics. And they may need uh, doxycycline or minocycline because they penetrate the brain very well. And they're anti-inflammatory. And we know in Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's is the adult correlate of autism. I already say autism is the childhood correlate of, of Alzheimer's. They have very similar, you know, oxidative stress, chronic inflammation. So, but it gets tricky when you say it's only Lyme because if they, if they fit diagnostic criteria, I, I just think you can't ignore the Lyme in those things. And could the Lyme be causing that dementia? Yes. And I think they need aggressive treatment. If you're going to use orals, you have to use combinations and higher doses. And if you're going to, and I think truthfully, they, did, they deserve a trial of IV antibiotics. I do. Because if you don't do it, you may, you, that's it. And the problem is the insurance companies won't cover it. And so if they can't afford it, you know, you're, you're left with people and, you know, we only do the best we can. Yeah, five more minutes. Two thirty. Four. Four. <laughs> oh, I thought I was being timely. Right? Oh. Well, this one is. Yeah, I know. We got the M and M's here. These are the healthy M and M's. These are the healthy M and M's. By the way, I usually say this, and I'm really. Apologize. I wanted to thank the M&Ms, Maggie and Maggie. And actually, I met a third Maggie. I've never been surrounded by a tree out of Maggie's. <laughs> One I know pretty well. One I just met. But they're, they're great people. So um, this is something that why is it that when I brought my dog to the vet, I could be in trouble with this one. We found out in minutes she had Lyme disease. When my husband had Lyme, we went from 2004 to 2007 before he tested positive. In the, he was a mean barnyard dog, your husband. <laughs> In the meantime, his condition got worse. Thank God we found the doctor when we did, or he would not have. So I think that's just his. I mean, I, I, I don't, I can't answer. I'm not a vet. Uh, they do probably have certain diagnostic techniques we don't have, and they have certain uh, treatments and things, but yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, what is it? And uh, does, last one, does chronic Lyme mean, does chronic Lyme mean I will always have it even after treatment? Well, you know, what I said before, and I'll stand by it again, I don't like to use the word cure. I don't use the word cure with autism. We recover autistic kids. I have many kids with autism that are now in college. You would never know they had autism. And so some could say it's a cure, but you know, I, I don't, for a chronic complex disorder, we like to say we either recover them, uh, we reverse it, we control it. So I don't know about the word cure. I think it gets tricky. Um, and medically legal, of course, I think we have to watch out. But I think the bottom line is, we want to get these chronic illnesses. Lyme is certainly one of them, but many of the other chronic disorders, chronic infections. We want to get it down enough to a point where the immune system, where your own immune system can handle it. And the problem is, our immune systems are overwhelmed and they're dysregulated. So if we can do the immune modulation part, if we can make the immune system more balanced and function better, and we can knock down the Lyme or the co-infections or other kinds of infections, then we allow that inherent immune system, like we talk about self-healing, to heal, okay? And that's what I would leave you with, is that we do the best we can, if it's infectious, to knock it down. But the ultimate healer is you, really. The ultimate healer is you and your immune system and all your systems together. I think I'll leave you with that. Thank you so much.